Uh, Dana, would you open us this morning? I would. Praise the Lord, Father, we come before you. And we thank you that we can come to your house, Father. And Father, we ask you to be with uh, Pastor Harry and the message that you want him to convey to each one of us, Father. But search each one of our hearts and our souls, Father, to look at those prayers that we just don't let anyone else know about. Mm -hmm. And Father, forgive us of our sins and bring us to repentant hearts, Father, so we can be a witness to Jesus Christ in our community. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, week two, so we're going into the book of Ecclesiastes and the well-lived life. Uh, before I actually even get started and we do the review, questions. Because we kind of blew through chapter one last week and anything kind of come to mind. I know a lot of you, as I was talking with you after class, you began to realize, wow, I, I see myself right there in chapter one of Ecclesiastes. You see the human condition right there. So, from the time of Solomon to now, what has changed? Nothing. Pretty much. There's nothing new under the sun. No. And exactly as, as Solomon's going to say repeatedly, that there, yeah, there is nothing new. Um, and kind of, uh, you've heard me say it before, and I know I will end up saying it again. The only thing we do different between now and Solomon's time is we get stupid faster. <laughs> okay. We've accelerated the amount, you know, how fast we can get to, you know, being silly. All right, well, let's kind of do a, a quick review then of, of last week. And what does the word vanity mean in Ecclesiastes? Just the word, just the definition of the word. Vapor or breath. Yeah, vapor or breath. It's just something that is there and gone. And, you know, we, we had our one week of winter last week. So, you know, you, you stepped out early in the morning, you could see your breath. Um, now I think it's going to be what I see, and it's going to be in the mid-70s all week. So we're back to being Arizona. But, yeah, that that is... He looks at all of those things in life and says, it's just like that breath that you see on a cold winter morning. It's there and then absolutely gone. I gave you three conclusions that I thought that we're going to see as we study this book. One of the three conclusions is that we're going to, in this study, is that all pretense of what in oneself has to be abandoned. Pride. pride. Absolutely. All pretense of pride. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to come up with the solution that is going to... No. All pretense of pride has to be absolutely abandoned. We're going to see that the sovereignty of God as we go through this book and the dependence on Him is absolutely the position that we have to be in. Solomon's big question, and we're going to see it again, I think, a little bit this week, particularly next week, and he hits this question over and over again. What do we get out of constantly doing what? Working. Yeah, that's his question. I'm constantly working. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm, I'm studying. I'm putting together Sunday school lessons. I'm going to my job. I'm doing all this stuff. What am I getting out of it? What is my profit? At the end of the profit and loss sheet, what have I gained by it? That's his big question. Why am I doing all of this? And most of you, at one point or another, have asked yourself that question. <laughs> Why am I doing this? What's it all mean? What's it going to... What's the, what's the difference at the end of the day? Why have I done this? And Solomon looked at a bunch of stuff and he said, some what just can't be solved and some information can never be revealed. But some what can't be solved. Some problems. He said, you know, there are problems out there that just can't be solved. No matter if the U.S. federal government gets involved. <laughs> there are some problems that just can't be solved. And we're up against one right now with this whole COVID thing. And I don't care how they keep throwing, but nothing. They, they haven't been able to solve it yet. And... Of course, the history of, of, of mankind and viruses is that we haven't eradicated one yet, so... We keep making more. Yeah. Well, we won't even go there. Yeah. But Solomon looked at everything and said, you know, there are some problems. We need to understand that there are problems out there that just can't be solved. And I've got to depend on God's sovereignty and keep right on moving. So with all that kind of in background, 
we're going into this week and really going to look at that question of what's it all mean? Why what? Asking that big question. When I was working on this particular lesson and, and putting this desk piece together, Cindy walked in and saw a picture on my screen and she said, hey, it's the poor little rich girl. Now, again, if you're of a certain age group, you know who I'm talking about. Her name's on the screen, which is Barbara Woolworth Hutton. She was known as the poor little rich girl. In 1933, 1933, so we're talking about the, the middle of the, the Great Depression. At 21, she inherited $50 million. And that was at a time when, you know, 10 cents would buy you lunch. She had inherited $50 million uh, from her granddaughter, grandfather, F.W. Woolworth, who founded that store chain. Again, you have to be of a certain age to understand that there used to be a store chain called Woolworths. Yeah. She got $50 million out of it. She was young, beautiful, idealistic, and she began her quest for meaning and purpose. At one time, you could, if you were, had been good friends with her, you could have cruised the Mediterranean with her on her 59-room yacht. <laughs> Travel through Europe in her plush private rail car. That's not the rail car. In that rail car, it had a master bedroom guest suites, a marble shower, a dining room, and all of the latest technology of the, t of the time in her rail car to travel around Europe on by rail. In her mansion, you could see the masterpiece Julie. That's this. A 1787 oil painting by Vigie Lebrun of his daughter Julie. Or carefully hold an imperial family rose cup from the Yangtze period in China. This was in her house. You might have even dined with one of her seven husbands that included Cary Grant or a number of royalty, lower level royalty from around Europe. Yes, as she moved from, from husband to husband. But during all of this, with that big yacht and that rail car and, and all of these, you know, Count so-and-so and Baron so-and-so and Cary Grant, one of the movie stars of the day, she battled anorexia, drugs, alcohol, and divorce lawyers. She eventually died at age 66, weighing less than 100 pounds, and only had $3,000 left of her fortune. That yacht, that 59 foot, 59 room yacht, is now on Lake Mallorin in Stockholm, and it's a very exclusive bed and breakfast. You can stay on her yacht that is permanently docked on that lake in Stockholm. You can charter the rail car for your next client out. So Rick, next time you have one of your big clients, you really want to impress them, you can fly them to Europe and put them on that rail car. All over <laughs> Yeah, it's going to cost you a couple of trees, but you know. The painting, Julie, is in another person's private collection, and that rose cup could have been yours if you had bid over $17.8 million dollars at Sotheby's auction in 1999. Wow. So does that mean that Cary Grant could stand in that room and look at that picture and say, Julie, Julie, Julie? <laughs> <laughs> How long you been working on that one, Seth? <laughs> Just keep <named> Julie. <laughs> Thank you very much. You'll be here all week. <laughs> Sure, and tip your waitress. <laughs> but as it turned out, all that stuff didn't satisfy. Three thousand dollars 
less than 100 pounds, died at age 66, having never found it, never found what that meaning was. So Solomon asked that same question, or remember he's called the teacher. Anybody remember his name in Hebrew? Kuoleth, the teacher. So Kuoleth asked that same question, what's it all mean? And that's what we're going to see in as we go into chapter 2. So let's go into Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Somebody want to read the first 11 verses. Go ahead. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to, uh, to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I met silver and gold for myself, a treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me, and all this my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, and everything was meaningless, a, ca a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Mm. So the teacher explains his examination of pleasure. He, in those verses, he says, you know, here's what I looked at. And he explains it, and, and this is, I went in to examine it. We kind of laughed that off last week. Remember I said that he had looked at one part, and he was looking at all these, and pleasure, I said we would get that more this week. This entire area, he says, I'm going to look at pleasure. Let's see if that brings meaning. And he proposed a hypothesis. So he did the scientific method. He said, I'm going to give a hypothesis. Does pleasure give an adequate justification for human existence? So he starts with a hypothesis. He said, I'm going to, here's my question, and now I'm going to go back and examine it. So he does the whole scientific method. And his conclusion, right there, as Dana read it there in verse 11, was that it was just temporary. Barbara Hutton found the same thing. It was just temporary. And at the end of her life, it was gone. He looked at laughter and said, laughter was insanity. And fun didn't accomplish anything permanent. Now, at no point does, and several religious groups have said, oh, we have to be very dour, we can't smile. We can't tell Julie, Julie, Julie jokes in Sunday school. <laughs> and that's not what he's saying there on laughter being insanity. He said it just, it didn't give anything permanent either. He said it was not a solution for the basic problems of life. And that, that too was a failure. Now, what we're going to see as we go through this entire book that he recommends enjoying life. And we're going to see that today. We're going to see that again next week. He recommends, hey, you need to just enjoy the life that God has given you. But it doesn't give meaning to our existence. Then he said he tried alcohol. A number of folks have done that. A number of folks continue to do that. When I was a sergeant over on East Van Buren, we had, it used to be called Lark, it's changed names, but it was essentially, a lot of you will call it the drunk tank. And it was just a few blocks right there on East Van Buren. I set up my command car at <laughs> 24th Street Van Buren, so I was right in the middle of my area. And I would have these guys literally come up and just get in the back of my car and say, could you take me to Lark? <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's go. Drop them off. Here you go. 
But he tried alcohol. But notice, though, he said that he kept his wisdom, which means that he indulged in the pleasure without being consumed by it. And it, there's obviously a level of pleasure to it. Otherwise, it would not have survived all of these thousands of years. Some people say it, some of it tastes good. Some people go, ugh. <laughs> but some people say that, you know, about a, a medium rare steak, too. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a steak. <laughs> what he wanted to know if is if rationally controlled indulgence, if I can control this, just rationally control it, just take enough that, hey, boy, this tastes good, and, you know, I, you know, I get the pleasure out of it, will that give me meaning to my life? Without going full alcoholic and being controlled by it and having all the physical conditions of it, if I rationally can control this thing, some people can, some people can't, there are people that have two drinks and that's it. That you know, they're hooked for life. There's other people that can down it all day long and, and they're fine. And we're not even talking about that. But he said, if I can control this, am I going to be able to find meaning out of that? And ultimately he says, you know, alcohol did not take away the pain. It did not give me meaning to my life either. Then Okay, so he's tried laughing and, and just being, just having fun. That didn't do it. He tried alcohol. Uh, yeah, that tasted good, but that didn't do it. So then he tried building projects and possessions. We saw with Barbara Hutton, she loaded herself down with possessions. I would love to see that train car, by the way. Great Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that ship. I would love to just see this stuff that she, she acquired. But notice, though, there, for whom he said he built this stuff. Verse 4. I increased my achievements. I built houses and planted gardens for myself. Now, he had all kinds of technical feats of engineering, including aqueducts and other waterworks. The famous Pools of Solomon in the Valley of Artis, southwest of Jerusalem, may be a part of that system that still exists today. But having in that desert environment, in that dry environment, having big gardens, lush gardens, was a real sign of, wow. Think about Nebuchadnezzar and his big gardens. That was a thing that you built as a king to show how powerful and how well off you were. Right in this desert environment, I can walk in and have all these trees and water flowing and all that sort of thing. Which is why I've always said, I'm, I'm a desert rat, you know that, I'm born and bred here. And I always wanted to retire next to water. And I told God that and he said, thank you for your input, I have other work for you to do. <laughs> 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 but Solomon said, you know, I'm, I'm going to build this stuff for me. He had herds and slaves and flocks, and he was a wealthy patron of the arts, because it said right in there that he had his own choir. He could call on the singers and say, hey, entertain me. You know, he didn't have to go downtown and see who was performing what. He had his own singers. Hey, I want to, you know, I'm having some guests over Saturday. Be sure you have some songs ready. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 20 and 23 describes it even a little more. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea. They were eating, drinking, and rejoicing. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They offered tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Solomon's provisions... Listen to this. Solomon's provisions for one day 
were 150 bushels of fine flour, 300 bushels of meal, 10 fattened oxen, 20 range oxen, 100 sheep beside deer, gazelles, roebucks, and pen fed poultry. That was his food bill for a day. That's a wealthy guy. He's pumping out that kind of food, feeding that many people every day. <clears throat> Again, he said in, that, in Ecclesiastes that, that Dana read, both, that he retained his wisdom, though. He didn't get consumed by the possessions. So that lets the readers know that he didn't go berserk in his quest for luxury and pleasure. He went after it. He really examined it, but he didn't go so full hard that that's all it was. He retained his wisdom. He said, I'm going to, remember, he, he had his hypothesis. I'm examining this. I'm going to go in and really examine it, look at it. So his problem wasn't a lack of self-restraint. What he learned, though, is that any attempt to find rationale for existence in pleasure and affluence is bound to fail. Even if that attempt is sobered by self-control. Even if you're still in control of it, that is going to fail as giving you that big time meaning. So Solomon said, I'm going to I'm going to take this kind of from a scientific basis. I'm going to go in. I'm going to examine it full bore. And you know what? What did it say there in verse 11? It was chasing the wind. See, Solomon had worked hard and felt that he earned the right to enjoy himself. Anybody want to join Solomon with that feeling? That's what we do. <laughs> you know what? My gosh, I've, I've put in my time. It's time that I've enjoyed myself a bit. But the problem is that the payoff didn't match the effort that he put in. Anybody recognize that statement? I put in all this effort, and the payoff I'm getting doesn't match the effort that I put into it. So remember, he's looking at a balance sheet. He's looking for profit. And he says, it doesn't it doesn't even balance. It doesn't even get to balance. It doesn't give me a profit. It doesn't even match up. That's part of the problem, I think, is that there was no balance. Yeah. I mean, this guy only learned how to work here and learned how to play. I know other people who only learned how to play and never learned how to work. And neither one, and neither one is not gets, it, gets it to a, a profit level. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was all temporary. And, the final, and it did not alter the final outcome of his life. And he knew what that final outcome, this is written in his later years. What was Solomon's final outcome of his life going to be? Yeah. <coughs> he's going to die. So essentially what he said was stuff never satisfies. As I read this, I keep thinking, you know, I, 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 uh, and I keep, you know, what about, you know, Two greatest commandments: love the Lord and your God, and then love others. I mean, was he exhibiting any of that here? I don't know. For all his wisdom, he he really missed out on some things. <coughs> Everything revolved around I. Mm -hmm. Everything was I did this, I did that. I'm so great, I'm wonderful, I did this and that. You know. And he looked at that and said, "Look at what I did. I've amassed more than anybody." But the final outcome is, you know what? Just like the street beggar, I'm going to end up in the exact same place. What's it all mean? So with that examination, he moves on and looks at the relative value of wisdom. So the pleasure and all of that stuff didn't make it. So now he's going to look at the relative value of wisdom. So let's get back into Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I need somebody to read verses 12 through 17. Go ahead. Wow. Okay. So I decided to compare wisdom with foolishness and madness. For who can do this better than I, the king? I thought wisdom is better than foolishness, just as 
light is better than darkness. For the wise can see where they are going, but fools walk in the dark. Yet I saw that the wise and the foolish share the same fate. Both will die. So I said to myself, since I will end up the same as the fool, what's the value of all my wisdom? This is also meaningless. For the wise and the foolish both die. The wise will not be remembered any longer than the fool. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. So I came to the life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless like chasing the wind. Boy, he's just a happy guy, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but really, his wisdom takes him to that point of this stuff doesn't make any difference. The next investigation, then, is that of a philosopher looking at wisdom. And that first line, really, can be kind of paraphrased like this. Is a human likely to come along who will be better than the king? And once you get into the Hebrew and study that out, he's talking about the first man. He's talking Adam. So can, can somebody be better than Adam, who God made directly long ago? God started here, so somebody going to exceed that very first guy. In context, keeping it, because again, you always got to keep things in context. You can grab any verse and take it out and say anything you want. You put it back in context, and this line basically says that there's little chance that humans will behave with any greater wisdom than their very first ancestor. And we saw the wisdom of Adam. He let his wife talk to somebody she had no business talking to and then watched her eat something to see if that whole death thing was really going to happen. But no, hon, you go right ahead. You take that first bite. I'll stand right here and watch. <laughs> Apparently, and... There is a pun intended here. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> because we don't act with any greater wisdom than the very first person that God made. And we're certainly not going to exceed that. We'd be lucky to get to that level. Now he does say though that wisdom, and he's, there's some positive things to it. Let, let's, let's be real about that. He said, wisdom is like a light. The wise know where they're going. Even if they know that they're going towards trouble, <laughs> at least they recognize it. And that allows them to avoid some of the disasters and be prepared for others. So the wise can say, you know, okay, I'm going towards trouble. I, I can't get out of it. I'm stuck in this tunnel and that light coming at me is not the end of the tunnel, it's a train. <laughs> but at least now I can prepare for it. So he said, you know, there's some advantages to wisdom. Fools, though, are surprised by the things that happen to them. And they're constantly surprised. Well, how did that happen? Why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening me. to me? Well, <laughs> those of you that have raised children realize that at time your kids have been fools because they did stupid stuff and then they were amazed that bad stuff happened. <laughs> Kind of the big thing in life is hopefully that you actually go to school and you pass the class and you don't keep redoing that same class. But again, in my former profession as a police officer, I found people that repeated that class again and again and again and were always surprised by the outcome. Of course, I also loved doing 7 o'clock in the morning search warrants and, knock and blasting through somebody's door and saying, Wake up, sunshine. We're about to toss your room. By the way, you're under arrest. And the look of surprise on their face. 
7 o'clock, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> wow, they did, you did all this bad stuff. You painted up the entire neighborhood with your name. <laughs> How did I figure that one out? And now you're surprised that the police are coming into your bedroom. The wise person, Solomon figures out that the wise person can see death coming and contemplate it and think about it, prepare for it. And that is better than the mindless fall into death taken by the fool who is just caught off guard and surprised by death. He said, you know, it, it happens to the street guy or the rich guy that we're both going to there, but at least with wisdom, I can contemplate it, I can think about it, and begin to work and prepare for it. So he finds some, some benefit to wisdom. But he sees that nothing can stop death, and both the wise and the fool are going to end up in the same place. And in verse 15, that is very sobering to Solomon. So I said to myself, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Why then have I been overly wise? And I said to myself, this also is, is futile. This is meaningless. Now some with wisdom and the intellectuals will say, well, maybe just I can have the hope of being remembered. That's what all my life is. Even though, yeah, I'm not coming out with a a positive, just the fact that I'll be remembered. I wrote a book. Great. People will know me for generations now because I wrote a book. <laughs> I went to uh, Barnes and Nobles the other day and it was not on the shelf. I was a little sad. It's on their website. You can go to barnesandnobles.com and buy it, but it wasn't on the shelf. So what's my hope of being remembered? All right, I've got five kids. I've got eight grandkids. They'll remember me. Yeah. Until they're not here. Solomon said that the intellectual's hope is that he'll achieve this lasting fame and be remembered for his contributions. But he said, you know what? That also is an illusion particularly over time. As the average person does not remember the great men of history any more than a street beggar. And there are comedians that do these street walk things that prove this all the time. They go and ask oh, about, yes. you know, when was the War of 1812? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What countries fought in the American Revolution? Um, England? No. You ask them about some of the great names of, of history who have given us all of these things, and people go, uh uh, uh, I don't know. So, particularly over time, that whole idea of being remembered by humanity is also an illusion. A few do. Those who want to really study history or study something will know. But the vast majority, if you went out right now up to 51st Avenue and Baseline and asked them who the great king of France who really just exploded everything, Charlemagne, they'd go, no clue, no clue. Then they ask you for money. And then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we see his disappointment in verse 17. Therefore I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For everything is futile and, and a pursuit of the wind. All his life, Solomon thought that he'd been pursuing this grand task of wisdom. If I just really pursue wisdom, now I will have meaning to my life. I'll have that benefit. Then they realized what he learned was he'd just been trying to catch the wind. 
Because when he died, where did his wisdom go? Now, luckily, God decided to write a bunch of it down. But a lot of it went... What he found, again, is that stuff never satisfies. Now, a lot of times we say stuff, and, you know, the first time was pleasure, and it was lots of cattle and big buildings. But wisdom is also stuff. Education is stuff. And if you're putting that into your meaning for your life, I'm going to get degree after degree after degree. That also is just stuff. And that never satisfies. Even if it's head stuff, as opposed to physical stuff. Okay, we're, we're 0 for 2. <laughs> We've tried pleasure, physical stuff, alcohol, just general enjoyment. We tried intellectual pursuits and wisdom. So we're going we're gonna to look at one more. And that's having a legacy. That's something that people really hold on to. So let's go back into Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and read verses 18 to 23. Give me another reader. Go ahead, Bill. I hear all the things I have told for under the sun because we must give them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether the person will be a wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruits of my toil in which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who have not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and great misfortune. What do people get for all the poor of anxious striving? which they labor under the sun. All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is me. Wow. That's who said me. Yeah. <laughs> Solomon had worked, and now he rejected the idea that life is made worthwhile by simply being able to provide for one's children, or more generally, for their your pros, posterity. Yeah, I'm really bad at kids. <laughs> and an investment guy asked me, well, what do you want to leave for your children? I said, nothing. No bills. <laughs> yeah, I said, I don't want to leave any bills, but I'd like to zero out about, you know, the morning that I died. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't want my last check to bounce, but um, Solomon said that wasn't going to accomplish anything anyway. He had no way of knowing how long it would be before that big fortune, his family fortune, would be squandered by those who came after him. 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 25 and 26 begins to describe that a little bit. Something that Solomon didn't, wasn't around for, but it happened. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, Shishak, king of Egypt, went to war against Jerusalem. He seized the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasuries of the royal, royal palace. He took everything. He took all the gold shields that Solomon had made. So all this stuff that Solomon had amassed under his son, it all gets taken away. Remember, everybody had been paying tribute to Solomon. But now his kid comes to the throne and people go, nah, you ain't him. But that was because of Solomon. Well, there was a lot of reasons yeah. to it. 
But again, Solomon said, what's the point? Is it, what's the meaning of my life to provide this great thing for people who didn't work for it? Because how long is it still going to be there after somebody who's not worked for it has it? And just human psychology is that if you are handed something that you haven't worked for, how much importance do you lay on it? Not much. Because, well, hey. But again, what have we taught in our society over the last 30 years? Yeah, and it's all about me. I get a trophy for just showing up. He decides then, after looking at that, on a position of despair. And this is actually, again, you have to go back into the Hebrew. And when he said, I begin to despair, this was a decision he made. It didn't, he didn't go into depression. He decided on a position of despair. And he said, I'm not going to live by this myth anymore that hard work and well-earned wealth validate my life. Because that's a myth. Now, does that say that we should not work hard? No. No. Does that, not, does that say that we should not accumulate wealth if the Lord allows us to have it? No. But we can't look at it as this validates, this now makes me who I am. Otherwise, if we, if we don't do that, then obsession with fulfillment through work and accomplishments ultimately will lead to a crisis point when someone's whole life seems to have been working hard for nothing. This is the curse of the workaholic. If I'm going to have fulfillment in my life, be all about constantly work, then at some point I'm going to realize I've worked all this and what, has, what is my final tally of it? You get your dinner served on plates on the set of the garage. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago, but he learned. <laughs> Again, there's nothing wrong. He's not naysaying hard work. He's saying, this is not, I can't be obsessed with this as making meaning to my life. Not only his possessions, but even the skill and intelligence by which he acquired them are nullified by death. All those great decisions that you made when you die are now nullified. Being a great businessman means nothing in and of itself in the end summation. Because he said, hey, I wind up in the same place as the fool does. In verse 22, go back and read verse 22. For what does a man get with all his work and all his efforts that he labors with under the sun? He asked that question. In verse 22, the point is not what happens to his wealth after he dies, but what happens to the man himself as he works to get wealth. He said, you know, that's actually the important thing. Solomon sees that a person who is absolutely consumed with work burns themselves up for something that has no real lasting value. Again, this is not a treatise against working hard. There's plenty of scripture that tells us we need to be working. God put Adam, the very first person here, to work. In heaven, you're going to have something to do. It's not the pictures of sitting around on a cloud in a white robe with a, uh, a liar. You're going to have stuff to do. God is a working God. But to be consumed with it as the meaning of my life, it has no real lasting value. So much so that even at night, and we have two business owners and a manager, if you are absolutely consumed with work, how does your sleep go? Not very good. <laughs> Short 
spurts. Yeah. Very much so. Because if I'm consumed with that, it even affects my ability to just lay down and rest. To turn it off and just rest. Been there, done that. I have several of those t-shirts. And every once in a while, I like to go back and do this again because I'm an idiot. <laughs> you get up in the morning and you're already tired. Even a leg building the legacy, stuff never satisfies. So we've just had a, a chapter of happiness and light. <laughs> <laughs> but really, what has Solomon done? He's held up a mirror. And he has, he's, put in, he's held up a mirror for us to look at and say, which of these am I putting my effort into and trying to come up with meaning? Because he said, that's all just chasing the wind. So let's see what his conclusion was at the end of the chapter, verses 24 through 26. I'll read them. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. There is nothing better for man than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I have seen that this is from God's hand. For who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? For to the man who is pleasing in his sight, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give it to the one who is pleasing God, who is pleasing in God's sight. This too is futile in a pursuit of the wind. See, Kuleth, the teacher, we know him as Solomon ends this chapter by concluding, by counseling to enjoy the life that God has given you, as it is. Notice he didn't take any one of these things and say, this is the way. He said, however your life is, I got a lot of money, I don't have any money. I'm very healthy, I'm not too healthy. <coughs> I have a great long lasting relationship, I'm on my 15th relationship. He said, wherever your life is, he said, enjoy the life that God has given you now, as it is. He figured out that meaning wasn't found in pleasure, wealth, power, or wisdom. Those are the big four. That's what everybody goes for. One of those four or a combination of them. He said, it's found in the enjoyment of the everyday pleasures of life. Food, drink, and work. Enjoying work just because I have something, to, I'm doing something. I accomplished something. We just got Christmas put away in my house. And now we're, we're busy decorating for Valentine's Day, so that's going on. <laughs> but when that last box got put up and put away there was this great sense of accomplishment yeah yeah well there's that <laughs> but he said you know what just enjoy what you what you have right there he doesn't understand the phrase nothing is better than in this very rigid literal sense as if, thing, as if these things were the goal of life. In context, he's talking about how I should view life with respect to labor and the fruit it brings. I should say, I, I'm just glad that I, I'm... talked to the pastor this morning. He said he was glad to be above ground. <laughs> That's what Solomon said. Just be glad with what you have now. He's not negating the worth of higher values. 
But he insists that people should learn how to enjoy the return they get on their labor. Just enjoy that. Whether it's a lot or a little, don't let the world define for you what your enjoyment is on what you've accomplished. And he recognizes that the, the ability to enjoy and use the good things of life is a gift of God. That is God's gift to you, to be able to enjoy that. He looked at his creation and said, this is good. I enjoy this. I enjoy what I've made. And he said, I want that for my creation as well. I want you to be able to enjoy what you've done. Believers, above all others, should have the capacity to enjoy life that a non-believer can't possibly understand. But as believers, do we always do that? As believers, do we get caught up in all of these other traps? Why? Why do we get caught up in going for one of those other things, wealth or power or... We know that. What's that? We think we know that. Yeah, it's a pride thing. And what's the world telling us? Oh. Every day, in every commercial on TV. You deserve it. Yes, <laughs> that you should be doing it like this. And God says, relax. Enjoy what you have. Harry, there's one other question that Throughout the years that I've asked myself, and I've probably been asked several times, is how do you how do you shut it off? Because I don't know how to shut it off. I take work home. I wake up with work. I work my day. This is a seven seven days, twenty four hours a day, and I live it. And I can pick up the Word of God and I can be work reading it in it, and I'll start thinking about work. And I'll start thinking about my employees. And, and it, it's a vicious cycle that I, I genuinely do not know how to shut off. What you have missed out on by doing that, and I've been there, I still go there because I like to go back and repeat my mistakes. It's, it's comfortable for me, apparently is I have not taken the joy of what I had that day. I'm looking at tomorrow. So I let the problems and the concerns of tomorrow rob me of my joy that God says you have right now. Like, I can, like I'm going to have any effect on tomorrow anyway. I understand what you're saying, but I also know you could exterminate <laughs> yeah, there. Apparently, this is a comedy class today. <laughs> I need somebody over here with a snare drum so we can get a little. <laughs> but but we do that and we allow our joy. What what Solomon said is, just take joy in this. And we don't because I'm so concerned about tomorrow like I'm going to have any effect on it anyway. A lot of times what I do when that comes across my mind, and then I'm like, God said not to worry about tomorrow, worry about today. Just, you know, just to... Right, and another good, thing, another good thing to pray is, God, show me why I'm, I'm yeah. giving my joy for today. Show me why today was a good day. Show me why your hand was involved in today. I don't need to worry about tomorrow. Show me, just show me. Let me smile about my good God doing good things with me today. And take my mind there. Releasing power. 
<laughs> because we know what the disaster could be. And we don't trust. Sir? Well, I was going to say that at least twice a year, this chapter should be preached on from the pulpit at least twice a year. And those of us who are sports nuts, you just painted a picture of Tiger Woods. I've seen his $17 million home. I've seen his yacht. I've seen pictures of all the most gorgeous women in America that he's been involved with. Look at him. Is he happy? No. <laughs> Man, it's pitiful. <laughs> because Sorry. stuff Sorry never, him, yeah, okay. stuff never satisfies. Yeah. Oh my God. See, the ability to enjoy life is a gift of God, but we have to open, like any gift, we just had Christmas. Mm -hmm. If you got a gift and it's still wrapped up and sitting at home on the floor, how useful is it to you? You have to open that gift of being able to enjoy life on a today basis because that's a gift of God. Solomon recognized it. And Solomon recognized that, the, and he tells, he reminds the reader that God even uses those who are opposed to him. He said, you know what? God is in such control, and here we're beginning to see the sovereignty of God, that he uses those who are opposed to him to accomplish what he wants to get done. And that sovereignty of God is absolutely implicit in this concept. God uses the lives of the wicked to achieve his own purpose. And he wrote it here that he, this is the task he gives to the wicked to accumulate stuff that they're now going to give to those who God favors. The only true wisdom, which is not grief, the only true knowledge, which is not sorrow, the only joy in life are the gifts of God to those whom he regards as good, to those whom he has put on the robe of righteousness, because we can't put it on ourselves. And then he says, I'm giving good gifts to those who I consider good, who I look at and are wearing that robe of righteousness. And one of the gifts I'm going to give you, if you'll bother to open it, is to enjoy what you have right now. Whatever it is, Solomon didn't give any lines. He said, well, once you get, you know, This is a big concept, by the way, that many of us as Christians struggle with. Pastors struggle with this. Well, my church is only 75 people. I need to have one of them 3,000 member churches. Then, then I'll have a ministry. I need to have seven different campuses that all watch me on TV each Sunday. See, pastors aren't any different. We do all of this nonsense as well. And God says, my gift is for you to enjoy your 70-member church as much as your 3,000-member church or your five-member church meeting on your sofa in your home. Some have looked at this verse and have taken it to mean that Solomon views divine activity as just hopelessly arbitrary and little more than an equivalent for fate. But to the contrary, this verse doesn't present God as impulsive and unpredictable. It relates to the biblical idea of grace, the unearned favor of God. I'm giving this to you. You didn't earn the right to be to have joy in what you have. This is my gift. Mm -hmm. To believe that a person is ruled by impersonal fate, particularly the horoscope, <laughs> is intolerable. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what my life would be if I thought my life was being controlled by this impersonal movement of planets and stars and nonsense. 
And I'm appalled at the amount of Christians that look at their horoscope every day. To believe that every detail of life is controlled by a loving, personal God is a constant comfort to me. And now I can get joy because every detail is being controlled by a God who spoke everything into existence and loves me. Now I can sleep. Now I can take joy in whatever my station in life is because that's God's gift. Let me get two readers and we'll close. Jeremiah 20, these well-known verses. Jeremiah 29, 11 and Romans 8, 28. Romans, Jeremiah 29, 11. I've got it. Go ahead. So may I, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The Bean Baptist Church, do we know this? If we know this, then we can agree with Solomon and say that there's nothing better right now on this planet than to enjoy what God has given me here, whatever it is. All the rest of that stuff is chasing the wind. Or as the phrase that I kept putting on time after time is, stuff never satisfies. Rick, would you close us this morning? Father oh, God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for your word and the wisdom that you try to impart upon us daily through your word. We ask that we continue to walk in your ways and not ours, and that we become the more the peace and the joy and the love that you have. So we ask your blessings on this message that you've given us and the one we were about to hear from Matthew Derry. And we thank you again for everything you do for us in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. If you want to read ahead, chapter 3 for next week. This is probably the best known chapter in Ecclesiastes because it's got this wonderful opening poem.